happy to be there. Okay, honey. The Sneetches and Other Stories The Sneetches Now the star-belly Sneetches had bellies with stars. The plain-belly Sneetches had none upon thars. Those stars weren't so big. They were really so small, you might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But, because they had stars, all the star-belly Sneetches would brag. We're the best kind of Sneetch on the beaches. With their snorts in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort. We'll have nothing to do with a plain belly sort. And whenever they met some when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. When the star-bellied children went out to play ball, could a plain belly get in the game? Not at all. You only could play if your bellies had stars. And the plain belly children had none upon thars. When the star belly sneeches had frankfurter roasts, or picnics, or parties, or marshmallow toasts, they never invited the plain belly sneeches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away. Never let them come near, and that's how they treated them year after year. Then, one day it seems, while the plain belly sneeches were moping and doping alone on the beaches, just sitting there wishing their bellies had stars, a stranger zipped up in the strangest of cars. My friends, he announced in a voice clear and keen, my name is Sylvester McMonkey McBean, and I've heard of your troubles. I've heard you're unhappy. But I can fix that. I'm the fix-it-up chappy. I've come here to help you. I have what you need, and my prices are low, and I work at great speed, and my work is 100% guaranteed. Then quickly, Sylvester McMonkey McBean put together a very peculiar machine. And he said, You want stars like a star belly sneech? My friends, you can have them for three dollars each. Just pay me your money and hop right aboard. So they clambered inside. Then the big machine roared. And it clonked and it bonked and it jerked and it burked and it bopped them about. But the thing really worked. When the plain belly sneeches popped out, they had stars. They actually did. They had stars upon thars. Then they yelled at the ones who had stars at the start. We're exactly like you. You can't tell us apart. We're all just the same now, you snooty old smarties, and now we can go to your Frankfurter parties. Good grief, groaned the ones who had stars at the first. We're still the best sneeches, and they are the worst. But now, how in the world will we know, they all frowned, if which kind is what, or the other way round? Then... Up came McBean with a very sly wink, and he said, Things are not quite as bad as you think. So you don't know who's who, that is perfectly true. But come with me, friends. Do you know what I'll do? I'll make you again the best sneeches on beaches, and all it will cost you is ten dollars eaches. Belly stars are no longer in style, said McBean. What you need is a trip through my star off machine. This wondrous contraption will take off your stars, so you won't look like sneeches who have them on thars. And that handy machine 
working very precisely, removed all the stars from their tummies quite nicely. Then, with snoots in the air, they paraded about, and they opened their beaks and they let out a shout. We know who is who, now there isn't a doubt. The best kind of sneeches are sneeches without. Then, of course, those with stars all got frightfully mad. To be wearing a star now was frightfully bad. Then, of course, old Sylvester McMonkey McBean invited them into his star-off machine. Then, of course, from then on, as you probably guess, things really got into a horrible mess. All the rest of that day, on those wild screaming beaches, the fix-it-up chappy kept fixing up sneeches. Off again, on again, in again, out again. Through the machines they raced round and about again, changing their stars every minute or two. They kept paying money, they kept running through, until neither the plain nor the star bellies knew whether this one was that one, or that one was this one, or which one was what one, or what one was who. Then, when every last cent of their money was spent, the fix-it-up chappy packed up, and he went. And he laughed as he drove in his car up the beach. They never will learn. No, you can't teach a sneech. But McBean was quite wrong, I'm quite happy to say, that the sneeches got really quite smart on that day. The day they decided that sneeches are sneeches, and no kind of sneech is the best on the beaches, that day all the sneeches forgot about stars, and whether they had one or not upon theirs. The Zacks One day, making tracks in the prairie of Prax, came a north-going Zacks and a south-going Zacks. And it happened that both of them came to a place where they bumped. There they stood, foot to foot, face to face. Look here now, the north-going Zack said. I say, you are blocking my path. You are right in my way. I'm a north-going Zax, and I always go north. Get out of my way now, and let me go forth. Who's in whose way? snapped the south-going Zax. I always go south, making south-going tracks. So you're in my way, and I ask you to move, and let me go south in my south-going groove. Then the north-going Zax puffed his chest up with pride. I never, he said, take a step to one side, and I'll prove to you that I won't change my ways if I have to keep standing here fifty-nine days. And I'll prove to you, yelled the south-going Zax, that I can stand here in the prairie of Prax for fifty-nine years, for I live by a rule that I learned as a boy back in south-going school. Never budge. That's my rule. Never budge in the least, not an inch to the west, not an inch to the east. I'll stay here not budging. I can and I will, if it makes you and me and the whole world stand still. Well, of course the world didn't stand still. The world grew. In a couple of years the new highway came through, and they built it right over those two stubborn zacks and left them there, standing, unbudged in their tracks. Too Many Daves Did I ever tell you that Mrs. McCave 
had 23 sons, and she named them all Dave. Well, she did, and that wasn't a smart thing to do. You see, when she wants one and calls out, Yoo-hoo! Come into the house, Dave! She doesn't get one. All twenty-three Daves of hers come on the run. This makes things quite difficult at the McCaves, as you can imagine with so many Daves. And often she wishes that when they were born, she had named one of them Bodkin Van Horn, and one of them Hoosfoos, and one of them Snim, and one of them Hotshot, and one Sunny Jim, and one of them Shadrach, and one of them Blinky, and one of them Stuffy, and one of them Stinky. Another one Putt-Putt, another one Moonface, another one Marvin O'Gravel Balloonface, and one of them Ziggy, and one Soggy Muff, one Buffalo Bill, and one Biffalo Buff, and one of them Sneepy, and one Weepy Weed, and one Paris Garters, and one Harris Tweed, and one of them Sir Michael Carmichael Zutt, and one of them Oliver Bolliver Butt, and one of them Zanzibar Buck Buck McFate. But she didn't do it, and now it's too late. What was I scared of? Well, I was walking in the night, and I saw nothing scary, for I have never been afraid of anything, not very. But then I was deep within the woods, when suddenly I spied them. I saw a pair of pale green pants with nobody inside them. I wasn't scared, but yet I stopped. What could those pants be there for? What could a pair of pants at night be standing in the air for? And then they moved, those empty pants. They kind of started jumping. And then my heart, I must admit, it kind of started thumping. So I got out. I got out fast, as fast as I could go, sir. I wasn't scared, but pants like that I did not care for, no, sir. After that, a week went by. Then, one dark night in Greenwich. I had to do an errand there and fetch some Greenwich spinach. Well, I had fetched the spinach. I was starting back through town when those pants raced round the corner and they almost knocked me down. I lost my Greenwich spinach. But I didn't even care. I ran for home. Believe me, I had really had a scare. Now bicycles were never made for pale green pants to ride them, especially spooky pale green pants with nobody inside them. And the next night I was fishing for doubt trout on Roover River when those pants came rowing toward me, well, I started in to shiver. And by now I was so frightened that I'll tell you, but I hate to. I screamed and rowed away and lost my hook and line and bait too. I ran and found a brickle bush. I hid myself away. I got brickles in my breeches. But I stayed there anyway. I stayed all night. The next night, too. I'd be there still, no doubt. But I had to do an errand. So the next night, I went out. I had to do an errand. Had to pick a peck of snide. In a dark and gloomy snide field that was almost nine miles wide. I said, I do not fear those pants with nobody inside them. I said and said and said those words. I said them, but I lied them. Then I reached inside a snide bush, and the next thing that I knew, I felt my hand touch someone, 
and I'll bet that you know who. And there I was, caught in the snide, and in that dreadful place, those spooky empty pants and I were standing face to face. I yelled for help, I screamed, I shrieked, I howled, I yelled, I cried, Oh, save me from these pale green pants with nobody inside. But then, a strange thing happened. Why, those pants began to cry. Those pants began to tremble. They were just as scared as I. I never heard such whimpering, and I began to see that I was just as strange to them as they were strange to me. I put my arm around their waist and sat right down beside them. I calmed them down, poor empty pants, with nobody inside them. And now we meet quite often, those empty pants and I, and we never shake or tremble. We both smile, and we say, Hi! The End Thank you, Dad. You're welcome, sweetheart. You want to pick another one? 